John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. What a privilege it is to have a copy of God's Word in our own hands and to live in a nation where we are free to preach the Word and to teach the Word and to share the Gospel with our fellow man. I'd like to resume our series this morning from 1 John. We're going verse by verse, truth by truth through the book of 1 John. And we stopped right before Christmas, and now we're going to resume the series today. And we're going to begin here in chapter number 2, and where we left off in verse number 6. The title of the sermon comes from verse number 6, where it says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. You'll notice with me here, that there's a person being described by the Apostle John in this verse. And this person is saying something specific about himself. What is it that he is saying? He's saying that he is abiding in Christ. He that saith, he abideth in him. This idea of abiding is a favorite one with John. We read in John's Gospel this word, or a form of this word, 41 times. Probably the most familiar one is there in John chapter number 15. 26 times forms of this word are used in his three uh, letters here at the end of the New Testament. That word means to dwell. It means to remain, to continue with. Here it's used to describe the person who professes to be a believer. A person who says, yes, I'm a Christian. I am abiding in Christ. This person says, I'm abiding in Him. Now the concept of being in Christ occurs about 130 times in the New Testament. So it's a very important concept. Because it's speaking of those who have been born into the family of God. It is a wonderful and blessed place to be. Can you say that today? Can you say, I am abiding in Him, or I am in Christ? In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this is described with these words, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That verse describes the change that occurs in a believer's life because of the new nature that he has been given in Christ. Now you notice in verse 6 the Bible states that this person who says he is abiding in Christ should be walking like Christ. This speaks of following his example as we live our lives day by day. In other words, our walk is to match up with our talk. The word walk implies progress, doesn't it? And the progress that is implied here is that it's becoming more like Jesus Christ, first of all, who we are, and then how we live. How we live is a reflection of who we are. And if we are in Christ, if we are abiding in Christ, then we should be walking like Christ. This process of becoming like Jesus Christ, it must begin with the new birth. That's called justification, salvation, regeneration. And then it's to continue on as we abide in Him. And He abides in us. That's sanctification. And new birth happens automatically when we are born into the family of God. But this matter of becoming like Christ is progressive. It's day by day, allowing the Word of God and the Spirit of God to make us more like the Son of God. That's not accomplished in our human strength alone. We need the power of God to accomplish that. So whether we are a brand new child of God or a seasoned saint of God, it should be our desire to be Christ-like in our daily life if we say we abide in Him. 
In other words, that's the direction we are headed. And that's the desire of our hearts. We talked earlier in chapter number one. It's not telling us that we're going to be perfect. It's not a matter of perfection. It's a matter of direction and desire. So if I say I'm abiding in Christ, I'm in Him, I'm dwelling in Him, I'm one of His, then that's the direction I should be headed. And that should be the desire of my heart, is to become more like Jesus Christ. So we find here, thankfully, the Lord has given us help in our journey of becoming like Jesus. How's He done that? Well, He's given us His Son's example, hasn't He? Thank the Lord for uh, the first four books of the New Testament, the, the Gospels. And in those four books, we find an example of how Christ lived the human life. That's our example, the example of God's Son. He's also given us His written Word. He's given us a copy of His inspired and preserved Word. And in it, we find the words to help us that our lives may be conformed to be like Jesus Christ. And as we read it, and as we hear, hear the word taught, and as we hear the word preached, and as we share it with one another on a daily basis, God uses His Word to make us more like His Son. And then the third tool He's given us, and the third blessing, is His Spirit's indwelling. If you're in Christ, then Christ is in you through the presence of His Holy Spirit. And so He's given us the ability to become like Him and to walk like Him if we say we abide in Him. So abiding in Christ should lead to walking like Christ, and specifically, as we're going to see now in verses 7 through 11, especially in regards to our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, which is to be characterized by love. You'll notice those verses with me now, beginning there in verse number 7 and following. The Bible says here, Brethren or beloved, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment. I write unto you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes." Now we see here in these verses two commandments that are mentioned, an old commandment and a new commandment. Verse 7, John addresses, you'll notice, believers with the tender and affectionate term, brethren or beloved, which conveys his caring and his committed love for them. After communicating deep love for them, you'll notice he reminds them of two commandments. And both of these commandments center on the same theme. So let's look at the differences in them. First of all, the old commandment. You notice in verse 7, he says, which you have had from the beginning. And then he says, the word which you heard from the beginning. This is speaking of the Old Testament commandments and law. And in that, we find the commands to love God supremely and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 19 and verse 18, and then Deuteronomy, chapter 6 and verse 5. We find those commands all the way back then. But you will recall when Jesus was asked by his critics, what was the greatest commandment in the Old Testament law? Jesus combined and summarized these two verses in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. And this is what he said there. Now, i read them to you. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. So in an attempt, in an attempt to try to confuse the Lord and try to uh, put him in a corner that he couldn't get out of, those that were trying to uh, make him look bad, they received a mouthful and a, and a wonderful, wonderful summary here of the commands. And we find that portions of these commands were repeated also in Romans, Galatians, James, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Luke. Five different locations in the Gospels and the Epistles where these commands are repeated once again. And what we see here is that these words were given all the way back in the Old Testament, but now Jesus is saying, if you will obey these two commands, it will take care of all of those other commands. You see, the climate that Jesus was in at that time was one that all of these religious leaders and Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, they had put an emphasis on uh, all of these commands. Some of, some of them had been even added to uh, by them and, 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 and uh, really making everybody focus on, on things that some of the things that they had created themselves. These commands that Jesus said here, they were not new, but they had been neglected. An emphasis had been placed more on keeping the letter of the law rather than the spirit of that law. And you'll notice here, these, though these words had been heard by the people of God for centuries, they had been neglected. And now that leads us to the new commandment. You'll notice in verse 8, he says again, or on the other hand, or at the same time, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, speaking of Christ, and in you, speaking of believers. So it's important to understand that in that time, the Greeks had two different words for new one means new in time, the other meant new in quality or character. So this new commandment to love one another is not new in time. It had been around for a long time, but it was new in the quality or character that it was now being seen in and revealed in. How was that? Well, the answer to that question is found in the middle of verse 8 there. Notice the phrase where it says, which thing, talking about that commandment, is true in him, speaking of Christ, and in you, speaking of believers. John Phillips explains this very well, and I'll quote this to you, this explanation of this truth. When he said this, what was new now about the old commandment was its incarnation, first in Christ and then in the hearts and lives of his regenerated people. End of quote. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ gave the old commandment fresh life by demonstrating love for others. And it is the character and quality of of Christ's love that is to be exemplified in the lives of those who are saying that they are abiding in Him. Oh, if we could see people and love people the way Jesus did. And as you read the Gospels uh, in your private time, I hope that you'll look at the, at the compassion and notice the care and concern that our Lord had for his fellow man. And when he looked at the multitudes, he looked at them and he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. He saw them as, as baby chickens in need of a, of a mother's sheltering wing. That's how the Lord saw them. Sometimes when we see crowds of people or when we're in the middle of a crowd of people, whether it's in a traffic jam or whether it's uh, somewhere else in a, in a public venue, we just see them as being in our way, don't we? Where did 
did all these people come from? I wish they'd get out of my way. Oh, to see people the way Jesus did. He saw a little man who was a big sinner named Zacchaeus, didn't he? Who climbed up in a tree just to see Jesus. And he saved Zacchaeus that day. He went to his house. And Zacchaeus was converted. All through the New Testament, all through the Gospels, we see Jesus seeing people with love, especially his disciples. John, who did not identify himself in the Gospel of John as the writer, did not say, I am John the disciple, but he called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he described himself. He knew firsthand the love of Christ. And you know what people ought to know about us, folks? It's not every single rule and regulation that, that some Christians say that you have to obey in order to be right with God. Now, the Bible teaches us that we ought to be holy. The Bible teaches us that we ought not be like the world. But the Bible also teaches us that we ought to love like Christ, doesn't it? Jesus said, this is the great commandment. May we never forget that. The Lord Jesus gave this old commandment fresh life and quality in his example. A familiar verse that really connects all of this together. I'm going to ask you to turn there with me, please. John chapter 13. It's amazing how this verse connects all of this together, even in, the, in the, what the commandment is called. Look with me, please, in John chapter 13. 13, if you'll notice with me, verses 34 and 35. He was speaking here to his disciples as he was approaching his time of going to the cross, and he's giving them the most important things that he felt like were to give to them before he left them. And this was one of the truths. Notice verse number 34. A new commandment. I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now notice this, by this, by what? Loving one another, shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one for another. So we see here from verse 34 that the term new commandment that John used in 1 John, it came directly from the mouth of Jesus Christ, and those words are recorded here in the Gospel of John. These were words that John heard with his own ears. As we talked about in the opening verses of 1 John, John said or wrote, I'm telling you, I'm writing about what I heard with my own ears, what I saw with my own eyes, what I touched with my own hands. He saw it. He heard it. And we find here that Jesus spoke these words and he said the distinguishing mark of my disciples will be their love that they have one for another. Now as we look back in 1 John 2 and verse 8, we see that this not only is true love where it's to be found in us, but also we are to demonstrate true light if we say we abide in Jesus Christ. True light. Notice the latter part of verse 8 there. It says, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth, or is already shining. So we are not only to demonstrate the love of Christ, but to also demonstrate the light of Jesus Christ, that it is shining, shining in our hearts. This truth about the true light shining is also connected back to the life of Christ, just like the truth about his love. We see it revealed in the Gospels. In Luke chapter number 1, we looked at this verse recently during the Christmas season. 
And in the prophecy in Luke chapter 1, verses 78 through 79, the Bible speaks of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he said, he is the day spring or sunrise from on high, shining upon those who sit in darkness. You see, the birth of Jesus Christ marked the sunrise of God's eternal light and the embodiment of his love on earth. Christ embodied the love and the light of his Father. Yes, there's still darkness in this world. But as the gospel spreads, the darkness is replaced with the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse number 9, John wrote there when describing the, the coming of Christ and the incarnation of Christ. In that first part of, of John's gospel, he called Jesus the true light, which lighteth every man who cometh into the world. In John chapter 8, Jesus called himself the light of the world. So to John, love and light are part of the same gospel and they should be part of every believer's life if we are walking as he walked. Which brings us now to verse 9, where once again our attention is brought to one's talking and walking as it relates to loving other brothers in Christ. Notice the words of verse 9 with me, please. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness, even until now. So the first man in verse 6 was saying I abide in Christ and the Bible says if we say we abide in him then we should walk like him now you'll notice the two contrasts that are given here we see first of all he is saying I am in the light I am in the light who's the light Christ this one that is saying that what is he doing hating his brother in Christ. Boy, that's a conflict, isn't it? This leads to the clear contrast of love and hate, light and darkness. That word for hate, what does that mean? It means to detest, to harbor an attitude that despises someone else and to view them as your enemy. You'll notice here it says, this one who says he is walking in the light, same one who said, I'm abiding in Christ. It says very clearly here, if he hates his brother. Now it's important we understand here that John isn't using a generic term here for mankind in general. I was, I was speaking of mankind in general uh, a few minutes ago when I was talking about Christ's love and compassion. Notice here he's not doing that. Nor is he talking about our biological siblings. John is speaking here, we, see, we saw there in verse number 7, to the brethren or to the beloved, which are the members of God's family, the members of Christ's body by virtue of the new birth. Why do we call each other brother and sister as fellow believers? Because we have the same father, we've been born spiritually into the same family. And God sees us as brothers and sisters. If we as brothers and sisters in Christ detest one another, act hatefully toward one another, or despise one another, we've gone back to the shadows of darkness, which is not where children of, of light are to live. Amen? Once again, John is commanding us to leave the old darkness behind and to walk in the light. Leave the shadows of hatred, those shadows of unforgiveness and bitterness and jealousy, all of those things that characterize darkness. My friend, we need to be walking in the sunrise of Christ's light, which is his love, not in the shadows of darkness, which is hate. As verse 10 and 11 go on to explain, that this darkness, if you choose to walk in it, can blind your eyes and cause us and others to stumble. There are some that 
believe that he's talking here. It could be talking about believers who say that they are in Christ and walking in the light and hating brothers or sisters in Christ that they may not even be saved at all. Others teach and believe that this is talking about a true believer who has allowed hatred and bitterness to fester in their heart. And John is warning them, you're in danger if you do that. If you live with hatred and, and, and jealousy and bitterness in your heart, that's a very dangerous place to be. Now, I've, I've seen people in the world and talked to people in the world and seen them on TV, on the news and stuff, that don't profess to be saved. And, and when uh, they're talking about someone that they hate, they have no problem with saying, I hate that person. I hope they, I hope they burn in hell. I hope they, they, uh, they have a terrible life because I hate them, because of what they did to my loved one or what they did to me. Now, the Bible tells us that if we have the love of Christ, we're not going to feel that continually toward another brother or sister. And if we choose to remain that way, that we are going to stumble. We're going to stumble. And if you're able to say, I'm in Christ, and to live with this little part of your heart that hates somebody, especially another brother or sister in Christ, and you detest them and you despise them and you just cannot stand them and you hope evil for them, you need to check out whether or not you're truly a Christian or not, according to this text. And so we find here the two warnings, and we'll close here this morning, that are found in verses 10 and 11 about this matter of hatred blinding our eyes and causing us to stumble. First of all, in verse 10, we see that a life of love sheds insight on the path ahead. Verse number 10 says, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. To abide in the light simply means to live and dwell in the light of Jesus Christ. It's like Christ's love provides light like a flashlight does as we walk the path of life. Crystal's song goes right along with this truth. We don't know who holds tomorrow, but we know who holds our hand. When we love the brethren, we avoid many pitfalls, and when we love others, we end up helping them to avoid pitfalls as well. Christian friend, and brother and sister in Christ, we should never resent a brother or sister who is trying to keep us from falling into a pitfall. We should never resent them. Sometimes uh, Christians will get offended or upset with a brother or sister that that tries to uh, warn them and, and, and lovingly tell them to be careful because they see them slipping away from the Lord or or being involved in things that that they know are not uh, what Jesus would approve of. And sometimes Christians will get offended. We shouldn't do that. The other day I was driving down the road and Patty was with me. And I didn't see see that pothole. And man, I hit that thing full speed. Full speed. And I was expecting my tire immediately to go flat. I had that happen once before in Indiana. I was driving uh, down the main street of Spencer, Indiana, and I hit a pothole that must have been uh, as deep as the Grand Canyon, and I I hit it with the front tire, and I hit it with the back tire, and before I could pull into a gas station, both tires were flat. I mean, they... They just completely went flat. I wish that fellow that was riding with me would have said, watch out for that pothole. I asked him, did you see that? Well, he said no. And I believe he was telling me the truth, you know. But if he he was a friend, what would he say? Watch out for that pothole. And so it is with other believers. If we love one another, we're going to say, 
hey, I'm concerned about you. We should not be afraid of being accountable to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. I've made a mistake before in not doing that, and I can tell you it doesn't lead to a good place. Love makes us stepping stones. Hatred makes us stumbling blocks. Let's look at verse 11 and the truth we see here. Verse 11, a lack of love diminishes insight on the path ahead. Verse 11 says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I would imagine uh, we've all heard that, uh, that old saying that says, Love is blind. But according to this verse, love's not blind. Hatred is blind. What do we mean by that? Well, John warns believers here that when a Christian allows hatred to simmer and fester inside his heart, he will slowly lose his spiritual in eyesight or insight, and his path grows more dangerously dark. I spoke about that earlier, so I'm not going to stay there or park there, but let me say this. This word blinded here in this verse stresses the blinding impact of hatred in the human heart. I'm not going to give any illustrations, but if any of you have ever been around somebody, whether it be in your family or at work or maybe even in a church, whose heart is filled with hatred, you can attest and testify to the blinding impact that will have on their life. Not being able to see the path ahead is a very dangerous place to be. It's a helpless place. We take light for granted many times until we're trying to find something when it's pitch dark. And if you've ever tried to make your way through an area, uh, whether it's your, your house in the middle of the night where all the lights are off, or as an outdoorsman, I've tried to walk out to my hunting spot without shining a light before, and I have gotten lost and gotten myself in a bad place. Spiritually speaking, if we are being blinded by hatred, it will not lead us into a good place. So what's the application here? Well, first of all, what pitfalls are you dangerously close to falling into today? Because you've allowed hatred towards another brother or sister in Christ to fester and to remain in your heart. If you have, if you've allowed a hatred, hateful spirit and you're harboring alt towards another brother or sister, I can't take that away from you. I can't put my hand on your head and, and, and make that go away, but I know one who can. Look at chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you have hatred in your heart and it's gotten control of your life, take it to the Lord. Acknowledge it to the Lord. He already knows about it. And say, Lord, I need you to forgive me of this and take this out of my heart. And the Bible says there he's faithful and just to do that. Then let me ask you, are you abiding in Christ? I hope you are. Like I said, it's a good place to be, to know that, that you are in the hand of the Father and the hand of the Son, and that you've put your faith in Him, and that you have a desire to walk like Him and to become like Him, and you're headed that direction. That's a good place to be. If you're not in Christ today, what's keeping you from that? What's stopping you from coming to him and acknowledging that he died for your sins and rose again so that you might have a relationship with him? And just coming to him in repentance and faith and saying, Lord, I believe that you are the heaven-sent Savior who died for my sins and rose again. I will put my faith in you. If you've not done that, I want to invite you to do that today. You say, well, what will everybody think about me? They'll say, that's the best decision you ever made in your life. They'll say, welcome to the family. And my friend, there's nothing better than being part 
of the Lord's family. How about this matter? Does your walk reflect your talk? Does it? We read those verses in, in 2 Peter chapter number 1 where it talks about the progression and the growth and grace of, of true believers. And then as you get down to the last few verses, if you'll turn over there with me, please, and we'll close there this morning in, in 2 Peter, just a couple pages over, chapter number 1. And you'll notice with me after giving all of these characteristics of being partakers of his divine nature, there in verses 5 and 6 and 7, all of these, these qualities that Christ produces in our life. And the last one there is, 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 is love. And we find brotherly kindness or love, you'll notice there in verse 7. And then it says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice this, he that lacketh these things is what? Blind. And cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That sounds like a Christian, who had been, a person who had been saved, but they had become blinded. Blinded by sin. Look what verse number 10 says. Wherefore the rather brethren, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. It's saying, if you are blind, if you're walking like a blind man and you say you're, you, you are abiding in the light, you need to check that out in your heart and allow the Lord to examine your heart that you are one of His. Because if we say we are, we should be walking like Him. And as we walk like Him, it should reflect love and it should reflect light. This has been very helpful to me as I've read and studied it this week. I hope it's helped you this morning. And I hope you won't just hear it, but I hope you will allow the Lord to help you to live it as we become more like Jesus. Amen? Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and eyes closed as we stand together and we take time now to apply